Welcome back to Hardware Unboxed. We're here in Austin, Texas. We've just been at AMD's Ryzen Mobile 4000 Tech Day. So we've done a lot of learning about the new laptop mobile series processes. And we've got here for a bit of a discussion, Jared from Jared's Tech. So do you want to give a bit of an introduction and talk about your YouTube channel? Give you a brief little moment. Yeah, you pretty much did it all already. I cover laptops. That's all there is to know, really. We'll put links in the description so you can go and subscribe to Jared's channel. There's a lot of comparisons and that sort of thing that really we don't have time to cover at Hardware Unbox. So if you're interested in a lot of mobile in-depth testing and all that sort of thing, I think Jared does a really good job. So we've just spent a day, a little bit more than a day, talking with AMD, talking with engineers, doing some slideshow presentations and learning all about the new Ryzen 4000 processes. And at the time that this is allowed to go live will be during March. We're currently filming this in the middle of February. So there's a bit of a long NDA there. Yep. And so a few things might change. There might be some things that we've tested in the future that we haven't had hands on time with right now. But I just want to talk a little bit about a product that we probably won't have been able to test at this point, judging by what we've heard. And that's the new H series processors for sort of your high performance and gaming laptops. I think, you know, what have you made of the announcements so far? Is there anything that's really caught your eyes being particularly impressive? Yeah, well, it's like it's hard to tell until we actually have them for testing. And as you say, who knows if we've actually done that by the time <laughs> this video goes up. So that's a bit bit confusing but based on a lot of the numbers AMD showed which of course you know we've got to take with a grain of salt it looks pretty interesting to see how they at least claim that it stacks up with the competition so if, I guess even if it comes in under what they're saying it's still looking pretty good I think for gaming laptops yeah I think one of the concerning things that we saw at CES when they sort of first showed off these products was I think they were comparing H series to even stuff like Intel's desktop processors using the yeah. Firestrike physics yep. test, which is, let's be honest, probably not that representative of, of uh, real that's, world games. That's the only game I play is <laughs> Firestrike. Yeah, it's just uh, those jellyfish, man. They really Ooh, get me. It's yep. great. No, but it, it sounds like from what we've seen at the event that they've actually been able to provide data that's not just the fire strike test and I think importantly they've been comparing it to both six core and eight core at least the ninth gen parts so what have you seen from sort of that sort of comparison how do you think it's going to stack up to both the eighth the eight core and the six core chips yeah well based on the numbers that they've provided it looks like it's doing pretty well against the i7 and yeah that eight core from Intel so they were comparing it with the 9750h and the 9880h Yep. And yeah, they were claiming with at the 45 watt limit at least that it was beating it by a fair amount. Not in every single game that they showed. I think they showed like maybe eight or so. But I yeah. think in like six of the eight, it was a fair amount ahead. And then the others, it was a bit lower. It depends on the game, I guess, and how that utilizes the processor. Yeah, it was interesting to see how much of a performance advantage they were claiming even over eight cores. Because I think what we've seen from the 3750H is that not that impressive for gaming yeah. laptops. Not really. I mean, the last gen i5 comfortably beats it, so this is looking like a good improvement compared to that. Yeah, it's, it'll be interesting to sort of test and figure out how exactly they've managed to do that, whether we, we know that it's going to be much more efficient and clock higher and they've got more cores available in this sort of, you know, if you compare Core i7 and Ryzen 7, they've got more cores there. But it sounds like they've also been able to get the frequencies high enough through 7 nanometer or some other method that sort of allows them to get even a performance advantage. I think, would you say you were only expecting maybe parity with Intel parts or were you expecting them to sort of blow them out of the water? So personally, I, was, I wasn't, I was you know, buying into all the CES hype because I saw the Firestrike physics score numbers and I think that's where a lot of people were just like, oh, look, it wins in gaming. And, you know, we're sitting there going like, realistically, how does this actually translate? I mean, sure, maybe in some, but not others. But I think for the most part, probably wasn't the best example. So now that we've seen more frame rate information and have a better idea, I'm still expecting that they've probably shown best cases in a lot of instances because yeah. that's just what happens. It's the way it is. But, you know, even if it comes in under what they're showing, it's looking like it'll probably beat Intel's i7 in a lot of instances. Do you think as well that it will end up beating the 10th the gen parts? I think both of us were taking a bit of a look at what the current rumors are suggesting and I'm pretty sure by the time this video goes out, that stuff won't be announced. So hopefully we're not going to embarrass ourselves here. <laughs> but I think the current rumors are suggesting the 10th gen Core i7 will still be six cores and they'll still be using eight cores for the Core i9s. Hmm. So do you think that we're still going to be seeing that stuff hold up when we get to comparing to 10th gen? 
I think it's probably not going to be too different to what we currently have. So if the clock counts are the same, like when we went from 8th to 9th gen, it was only a really small clock speed bump. And realistically, if you're like hitting the CPU with a hard multi-core workload over time, in a lot of laptops, you're not really going to be hitting those higher boost speeds in a sustained yep. manner due to like power limitations and other things. So if they're just turning up the clock speed with 10th gen again, then how likely you actually hit that? Like the single core turbos, yeah, all right, that might be useful for some things, but like when you're playing a game for like an hour and you're maxing out multiple cores, I don't yep. think it's probably gonna offer that much of an improvement unless they change other things. Like maybe there's more cash or something, who knows? Yeah, I think the only thing that would really give them more performance is if they do what they've sort of done on the desktop and say, you know, this is a 45 watt chip, but really we're going to let OEMs run at it. We've seen many that run it over 50 watts, but if they push that up to, you know, 60 watts to try and get that advantage. And I think while that's not great in a laptop form factor, because you need, you need bigger cooling and you need different systems, when you have plugged in, that like a lot of people do, they could still have a pretty significant performance gain if they do that. I'm not expecting that they will, but I guess that's something that maybe they would consider. Yeah, it's possible. It depends on the machine because, like, obviously, if you start cranking up the power limits, you're going to need better cooling in order to actually yeah. manage that. So and it's also – I don't think there'll probably be that much improvement because it's still, like, the same 14 nanometer plus, 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 plus. This will be the fourth plus. I, I think it's count. four pluses, yeah, I think. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, yeah, so – same architecture, you know, how many yeah. differences can there be at that aspect, really? Yeah, I think the only thing that will, the thing I think that could be more realistic that we'll see is maybe Intel putting more focus on their Core i9 product as opposed to, because we see the 9750H really being the sort of mainstream to high end choice for a lot of laptops, right? So yeah. if they suddenly decide to go, well, we're not, we're not going to use the 9750H anymore, maybe it becomes the Core i9 9010. 9, 10, 8, 80H, these names, man, so bad. The 10, 8, 80H, right? For yeah, cores? yep. If they start pushing that more, then that's probably another way they could gain. But even then, it sounds like from these chips that that's not still not going to be enough. Yeah, because, I mean, it's nice to have more cores, but again, if you're actually using them, power limit's going to go up, heat's going to go up. Yep. It's still going to come down to realistically requiring a thicker machine unless you're doing... I mean, it's still going to give you an advantage in multi-core workloads, even if the cores are clocked lower compared to, like, say, the i7 with six cores, depending on what you're doing. So it's really going to depend on what you're doing. But I think if they want a meaningful improvement due to no architecture change, probably going to have to get a thicker machine or better cooling, which yeah. is probably hard to do because a lot of the laptops out there at the moment, a lot of the companies are already kind of resorting to, like, esoteric cooling methods in order to just keep what we currently have cool. It's like all, all sorts of crazy designs. Like ever since, I guess like Asus did the Zephyrus, you know, like lifts yeah. up and there's like that Acer one where the keyboard pulls down. There's like all these crazy things that they've had to do that wasn't really required in the past, at least quite as much, just to keep what we've got at the moment cool. So if we just keep going up and up and up without making improvements. like Yeah, it sounds a bit like these, these Ryzen chips are gonna see stuff go the other way where instead of needing crazy cooling solutions, they'll be able to provide maybe cheaper cooling, thinner cooling, or sort of just keeping the designs they've currently had while providing more performance. So I think that's going to be big. I mean, you, we've seen here and you've seen at CES in more detail the Asus Zephyrus design, which looks really nice. Oh, uh, the G14? Yeah. Yeah, it looks pretty good. Uh, what they were saying at CES, it, it really sounds like they've considered all sorts of different thermal aspects. I can't remember the details specifically at the moment, but there were a lot of different, like there were like five different aspects that were like, we had to consider this detail and then this detail and all of these things in order to get this hardware fitting in this like thinner 14 inch laptop. Yep. So they've definitely took it into consideration, which makes more sense after what we saw at the, the AMD thing, because they mentioned that it uses the HS chip. And I didn't actually know this prior to the AMD event, but in order to use the HS things, there are certain criteria the laptop has to meet yeah, and one of those was thermals. So, it seems like from AMD's side, if you want to use the HS versions of the CPUs, you've got to have some level of cooling. I don't know what that is, but it it mm. looks like AMD are in kind of enforcing that. Yeah, it, it sounds quite similar to almost what Nvidia tried to do with Max Q. Obviously, on the GPU design, where they sort of they 
I'm not sure whether they invented, but they certainly assisted in the development of things like that keyboard at the bottom, cooling at the top style design that we saw used on a couple of laptops. And it sounds, yeah, I was actually quite surprised by a lot of the things they said were required to get the HS series chip, not just the cooling, but also they were saying they were required to use the high-end validated components that will lower power, things like more efficient panels, you know, mm. the optimal SSD and sort of RAM configurations that allow for better efficiency. So it sounds like, you know, you're not just getting that 35 watt chip, you're getting all these other things with it. And I hope yeah. that, I hope AMD finds some way to advertise that to users, because I think a lot of people are just expecting it's a simple, we're just pulling the clocks down a little bit, clocking it lower, yep. giving you that lower TDP. But it sounds like it's a lot more than that. Yeah, that's that's how I thought it was when I saw it at CES. I was like, okay, lightly, slightly lower TDP chip. Yeah. Cool. I guess that makes sense because it's in a thinner machine. But yeah, it really sounds like they're kind of trying to like do a lot more than that and make like make it so the whole system is going to offer a better experience. So that's good. Yeah. Another thing that I really wanted to talk to you about is a bit more about undervolting because it's something that we don't really do on the channel. We sort of just when we test these mobile parts, we cover like stock performance and all that sort of thing. But for most of your laptop users, all of them at this point, you do go into undervolting. So yep. do you want to just talk a little bit about what you've learned from you know how these chips are going to be able to be undervolted, where that's possible and that sort of thing? Because we did get a bit of information about that. Yeah, sure. So basically what undervolting is, I guess I'll start there. Yeah. So for those that don't know, it's essentially uh, you lower the voltage of the chip. So on the Intel platform, you can do this with software like Intel XTU or third party tools like throttle stop and you lower the voltage and generally by lowering the voltage, less power equals less heat. So it can be a good way of improving thermals or if the power limit's being hit by using less voltage, you'll be able to get some extra performance out of the power that is available. So yep. it's generally a quick and easy, well, I guess once you know what you're doing, quick and easy way to gain some extra performance out of your machine, which in a laptop, you know, usually you're both thermally and power constrained. So undervolting can help there a lot. Uh, so with Intel at the moment, they, do, they support undervolting through XTU, as I said, and generally you can get some pretty good gains. It depends on the machine, but you know, like for example, Cinebench R20, it's pretty, pretty common to see like anywhere between 200 to 400 point boost in multi-core, which is- That's big. That's fairly significant. So it does, it does really add up. So going into the AMD event, you know, I've wanted to know, can we do this with the AMD CPUs? Is there gonna be some similar tool? Because in the past that hasn't been possible with previous uh, Ryzen mobile CPUs. So I was hoping that would change this time. And it sounds like it sort of is changing, but not quite as much as yeah. I would like. So AMD basically said that undervolting will be possible, like technically, but they're not providing a software tool that will allow users to go in and do that themselves. But it sounds like, well, what they said was they, they'll be presenting hooks so that developers can get in and make those changes. And they're hoping that OEMs will come up with their own software solutions to do that. So it's probably not going to be something that's like as common on the Intel platform. Hopefully someone does get out there and makes a good utility like throttle stop for AMD systems. That would be really nice. But the other thing that could be interesting is AMD mentioned that it's also really going to depend on the specific CPU. I mean, that's the same on Intel right now. So you can undervolt by different amounts and it varies by chip. Like it's a silicon lottery yeah, thing. Yeah. Like how much voltage the chip needs at different clock speeds, it's gonna vary by each piece of hardware. And AMD said that they're basically, they're testing these CPUs, I guess at the factory. So they're working out what clock speeds each individual chip can run at, at different voltages. And they're already adjusting it such that you're probably gonna get most of the performance already anyway without undervolting. So, I guess it's you know a typical AMD move. They don't really leave, I guess, gas in the tank, so to speak. Yeah. Like with Radeon graphics and their CPUs, generally you don't get as much overclocking headroom as say Intel and Nvidia. They're already configured yeah. quite well to perform and it sounds like that's what they're doing here. So even if we do get the tools to undervolt, probably unless you know, you're only doing like a small amount and you're an enthusiast, you know what you're doing, you're probably only gonna be looking at a little gain. Yeah. Again, we have no idea, but that's what it sounds like. Yeah, it was really interesting to hear about how they were sort of configuring and sort of not necessarily binning, but certainly testing these chips. And I would expect that 
like we see with the desktop parts like 3900X and 3950X, how they are binned differently and they, even though the 16 core part is more cores, it uses roughly the same power. I would expect that they're doing something very similar with the mobile chips, especially for say your, 90, or your 4800HS and 4900HS and the non-S models. So I would expect that if you bought like a 4800H system that the undervolting potential is not quite going to be there and you probably they're probably taking those good quality chips that would have that potential and simply making it that higher clocked component. Yeah, it would make sense because a, a, a fair few of those CPUs have the same core and thread count, but yep. they say, you know, they're all 45 watt parts. So if the higher end parts are clocking higher, then they must be binned better. Yeah. There's going to be some difference, right? Yeah, and I think, yeah, it would be really interesting to see how those parts truly compare because again we see with intel parts the same core count and same thread count parts especially across generations there's not much performance difference because you get that they all just run at the same power limit and they just clock at the same rate normally so if there is a difference with these amd parts that would be something that we really haven't seen too much of before yep. so what else do you think about some of the we haven't seen, for example, a lot of systems that have been shown off using these H parts. We saw a few new systems using the U series parts. It sounds like those might be coming a bit sooner, but it sounds like for the H parts, they're still waiting on a potential upcoming product release that might be paired with this. Do you think that we'll see when NVIDIA releases their super GPUs for laptops that a lot of these might be Ryzen for the first time or at least have a Ryzen and Intel equivalent? Yeah, it's hard to say. Like the only, the, so the best, well, I guess most powerful gaming laptops we've seen so far, at least, you know, now making this video <laughs> a month before it goes up, that is. Um, yeah. So the most powerful option is um, probably that ASUS G14 with the 2060 Max-Q. So I did actually ask, like, are we going to be seeing more laptops with more powerful GPUs? And, you know, they'll pretty pretty keen to mention that there'd be the 5600 and 5700 M1s, which we yep. knew would be coming at some stage. I still haven't actually seen any laptops claiming to have the 5700 M yet, so who knows yep. how that's gonna go or when that'll happen. But yeah, they said they'll, like there's nothing stopping like different vendors using high power GPUs, it's really up to them. So it's not as if like AMD are limiting that. Yep. So yeah, I guess if there were new NVIDIA graphics not too far away, then it would probably make sense for a lot of them to just hold off a little bit more before launching those. Otherwise, you get into this weird situation where you have like a 2070 laptop, and then if there was a 2070 Max-Q, then like, sorry, not Max-Q. Super. Super. Yep. Super Max-Q. Yep, no good. Jeez. Those names are going to be so bad. <laughs> I'm already getting confused yep. just thinking about it. Yeah, so if there was like a 2070 version of the laptop and like a month later, 2070 Super, like, you know, do they stop selling the old one? If they still have it in stock, are people still gonna buy it? It's a bit yeah. of a mess. So if there's new stuff coming, I feel like they'll probably just wait a little. Yeah, I, I really hope that a lot of these companies, some of the big names that we see in the, the laptop space really harness the Ryzen brand for this. Because I think we could see potentially AMD struggle a bit more with the U-series stuff because they have to deal with OEMs like HP, Dell, Lenovo, all those sort of companies that don't really use the Ryzen brand from a gaming perspective, as opposed to like an ASUS would or potentially like a, an MSI would. Mm. So I think from that, it'd be really interesting to see whether like an MSI or Gigabyte laptops, they go, well, you guys are probably more likely to understand the Ryzen brand. So we're more comfortable, you know, putting a 4800H in because because we know that even if these parts perform better than Intel parts, there's still that brand issue of sort of, yeah. AMD seen as the cheaper option. People might have bought the 3750H systems and been you know, underwhelmed with the performance compared to like ninth gen. So they, I think it'd be really interesting. Do you think we'll see a lot more AMD laptops than we've seen previously? I think we will. So something interesting that I found like during the last couple of days was uh, during one of the presentations when they mentioned that the 3750H was essentially an opportunistic part Yep. So it sounds like they had the 3700U and then they were like, oh, hang on, we can just boost the power a bit and oh, we've got a gaming CPU. So that might be why that one wasn't quite as popular. And, you know, I guess it seems like, it, to me at least, it seems like it was a bit more of a test. And now- yeah, with, it wasn't super well tuned. Yeah, it, was, it, wasn't, it wasn't great. Let's just put it that <laughs> yeah. way. The new stuff looks much better. So it seems like they've gone more all in. And because that's happened, you know, assuming the performance is actually there and all of these different laptop companies are able to test this out for themselves, I think chances are they'll probably see, you know, assuming the performance is good, they'll be 
you know, interested in going more, more all in on, yeah. on that new part. Yeah, it really sounded like there was one particular presentation they were going through these gaming chips and it was almost like AMD suddenly realized that gaming laptops were like a market that people actually bought into. They were like, oh, we checked the numbers and hey, actually people buy gaming laptops. So we figured wow. we actually needed a gaming chip. So I think, as you say, they've really taken out the stops and put a bit more time into developing these H series parts and they're much more keen on advertising that part. Because the 3750H were like, they just slipped it out. It was like, here it is. It's in a few systems. We're not talking too much about it. Whereas, you know, in the past couple of days, not only have we seen performance from pretty much all of the U-series parts, but also all of the H-series parts. Yep. So they're really going into it and saying, you know, these chips are ready. We're confident in the performance. We're willing to show you numbers and that sort of thing and talk to you about it, which, you know, again, we haven't tested it yet, but it gives you confident, a bit more confidence than we've seen from previous gens. Yeah, it's, a, it's quite a big difference because when the 3750H came out, I didn't even know it came out. Like yeah. apparently it launched at CES last year and I was there and I didn't see it in any laptops. I even went into like the AMD booth and had a look around. I mean, there might've been some, maybe I didn't look at the specs of every single machine, but apparently yeah. it was announced at CES and like I came out of it not even knowing about it until like a month or two later. So it really seemed like it was a quiet launch. They weren't, you yeah. know, they weren't trying to make a big fuss about it. Whereas now it seems like it's completely different. So hopefully that means I've actually got something good. Yeah, I mean, this has always been the struggle with AMD laptop chips. They're, they've had no trouble getting like the A series APUs or even like your Ryzen 3s and Ryzen 5s currently in sort of your really budget, like port not even necessarily ultra portable systems, but even like you just entry level 15 inches, entry level 13 inches, whatever. Whereas what we're all really interested in is seeing, can they actually get the H series? Can they get the U series in premium designs in laptops that have, you know, RTX 2060, RTX 2070 graphics in it that people are going to be buying in volume? And I think that it might be a few years before we see them really take off in that space, but at least they've now, it sounds like they've actually got a product that matches the sort of marketing and needs that people want so yeah so even if the performance is a fair bit better than what intel is offering just like what we saw on like the desktop side when ryzen came out it might take a couple of generations to like start yeah. getting some traction get people to actually trust it and you know it could yeah. take a bit of time how do you see the sort of the value proposition of these parts coming into play like i did a bit of an interview earlier with an amd executive that sort of was didn't say too much about the pricing because AMD is a company that, unlike Intel, doesn't publish unit pricing for U and H series like mobile chips. But it still at the same time sounds like potentially Ryzen mobile parts will be equivalent or cheaper, which is good to hear. Would you think that's going to happen as well? Yeah, that was the kind of impression I've got. So it's, yeah, as you say, they didn't say anything about pricing. And, you know, I guess you could probably go out and find a laptop that has a new Ryzen part and an Intel part and compare, you know, what they're selling it for. There aren't that many at the moment. There'll probably be more by the time this comes <laughs> out with pricing. But uh, yeah, it's kind of hard to say because they don't really give us that information. But in the past, I've talked to companies who have pretty much flat out said that the AMD parts are cheaper, but that was with Ryzen 3000 series. So you would kind of expect yep. that because I guess they were trying to get the adoption at that point. Yep. And you know, as we mentioned earlier, they weren't performing quite as good as the competition. So it might be a different story this time. Yeah, I mean, you say that, I mean, when I interviewed David McAfee, he said that there w weren't gonna be too many changes in pricing. So the Ryzen 7 parts from this gen would be priced similarly to the Ryzen 7 parts from previous. Okay. So if, you, if you've got the information that they're cheaper for OEMs and I think we've seen a little bit of the actual unit cost for the laptops is a bit cheaper then I, I, from the sounds of it it is going to be a similar situation with this generation whether or not that means that you know the 48 they're talking about 4800H or 4900H or the core the Ryzen 5 who knows exactly where that that will play out but you know I think one way they're going to have to get traction is by being at least a little bit like $100 cheaper would be would be nice, especially if you get more performance and oh, yeah. the word of mouth will start going out for that sort of things and yeah, yeah work out. Then it's just, I guess, up to the companies that are actually making the laptop and how differently they price them. Because, you know, if you're like an ASUS or an MSI or something and you've got this product that performs better, then maybe you might want to sell it for more money. So it also depends on them. It's not just all about the prices that AMD and Intel set. Yeah, exactly. Is, it, is there anything else interesting that you found from the event as far as like the gaming side of things, the H-series side of things goes? Uh, 
There was a lot of talk around battery life optimizations. That was pretty interesting. So they did like a lot of like deep dive talks and battery life was this whole area they focused on. And they spent a lot of time talking about all the improvements they've been making, like improving the efficiency of like idle states and how quickly the like CPU can power down cores and stuff. And it sounds like there's some good improvements there. I think, so we did ask for like a, a hard number, I guess, in terms of like how much better is the battery life compared to Ryzen 3000. And the number they seem to be throwing out was around 20% better. So that's pretty yeah. significant for like one generation. I mean, I don't know if that's for like an, an comparing the new eight core compared to, you know, they only had the four core at the, that yeah. was the best option last time. Maybe that's comparing four core to four core. I don't really know. But it sounds like yeah. there's going to be some improvements, especially due to just seven nanometer as well. Yeah, it, it sounded like we're going to be getting both a situation where we get two times the performance per watt has been talked about a lot. Yep. And then we're going to be seeing, you know, potentially 20 to 40 percent more performance than Intel's parts. And then on top of that, 20 percent better battery life than the previous Ryzen parts, which I think AMD even admitted was not their greatest strength with those Ryzen 3000 parts. And they've certainly done a lot of optimizations. But and on top of that, they've been talking a lot about it's not just the APUs that are going to be making these next generation products better. It's the fact that they're working closer with the partners to use lower power components using, you know, one watt displays has been a big talking point here, yep. which can cut, you know, the displays a significant power sucking component and going from the 1.6, 1.4 watt panels in the previous gen to one watts now is going to give a big advantage. And then using all these other efficient things, including LPDDR4X memory, mm -hmm. is going to completely change this ecosystem and not give you just 20% from the APU, but more than that is you start adding all those components together. And I think the numbers that they've been showing, I think they did a direct, I mean, this is U-series, getting to U-series now, but they sort of compared their 3700, not their 3700, their 4800 U system to the Intel Ice Lake platform, and they were seeing similar to slightly better numbers. To, they did a whole breakdown. We can probably show you the slides on the screen, but they did this breakdown where they showed you the performance differences for battery life and it sounded like they're doing quite okay because that wasn't an area that people were super impressed with in the previous generation yeah and it looks like they've also done a lot of good improvements to the vega graphics as well so yeah. that will help with power efficiency also so like when you're not you know sitting there playing a game which you know is obviously going to get not great battery life anyway but when you're just like you know, in Windows browsing around or whatever, probably yep. most of the time using the Vega graphics. So now that that's also seen improvements, it'll, it should also factor into the battery life savings as well. Yeah, so I think we'll, we'll be seeing that not just with the U series, but the H series, because they seem to be keen on suggesting that like these H series chips for laptops are going to be not just for gamers, but also content creators. And they want to make sure that as those people take their devices around, that you know you get terrible battery life if you're gaming but they needed to i think they're talking like 10 plus hours from a you know 15 inch h series type product which is pretty good i would i would think uh, i never trust battery life estimates well just, that's they right never, never end up being yeah that good. they're never that good so you'll have to do a bunch of benchmarking into that stuff and see yeah. how it stacks up yeah but yeah i think that's pretty much all the all the interesting gaming side of things to to get through by this point Hopefully you would have already seen how the U-series chips go, sort of the full breakdowns on both hardware and box. You'll probably get one as well, do some of that testing. So check out both of those videos. Fingers crossed that has happened because it's still hard to predict a month into the future to see whether yeah. we've got the units in hand. I think there's been, there's been delays from the certain demonetizable virus. Can't talk about so that. Can't talk about that, but that's affected things as well a little bit. So yeah, I'm, I'm really excited for this generation. I think it's gonna be good. Yeah, me too. Looks good. Can't wait to test it. Hopefully I've already tested it out by the time this video goes up. <laughs> yeah, we'll be even more excited. We'll, we'll pin some comments if anything's changed significantly from what we've talked about in this video, because yeah, again, they've set the NDA date quite a fair way in the future. And of course, check out Jared's channel. Check out all the testing that you're gonna be doing across these H series things. You'll probably get way more H series laptops than I'll get in for testing, so. Yeah, we'll see, thanks. Yeah, so yeah, definitely check that. Links in the description. And yeah, as always, subscribe to Hardware Unbox. Give it a like if you enjoyed our little collab. I think you've been on the channel once before, but like very briefly. Yeah, I did a, did, I've done the Hardware Unbox collab with Steve at Computex. Yeah, that was, that for was like nice. For like two seconds. We'll get you back on at Computex this year if that goes ahead. Again, the virus, mm, yep. you never know what the virus is going to do. Yeah. Um, what else? We've got our Patreon page as well. Check that out. Merch, like this t-shirt I took to 
United States and all that's in the description below and yeah, I'll catch you in the next one.